Hi everybody and welcome back to Digital Integrated Circuits. We'll now continue with Lecture 6 which discusses interconnect. So after a first glance at interconnect and then going down into capacitance, we're going to now discuss resistance. So as we probably learned in an early physics course, wire resistance um, is something that we have to use the, the dimensions of the wire which include the width, the length, and the height of the wire. So if we know the, uh, the coefficient of the resistance, which we call rho over here, so the resistance is actually how much current we can, um, we can push through the wire or what kind of resistance it sees, and that will be the rho, the, uh, the current, uh, the resistance density, um, times the length of the wire divided by um, the area that the wire goes through, and the area is just the um, w, the width of the wire, times the height. So we get rho L divided by H times W. Okay, interestingly, if we look at a two different resistors, and this is one resistor and the current's going this way and this is the second resistor, even though this resistor is much bigger or this conductor is much bigger, the resistance is exactly the same. And that's due to this ratio type of a thing. In fact, um, a square always has the same resistance, okay, which would be called R square, where R square is defined as rho divided by H. So if we take this part of the, uh, of the formula, and it's a constant because the height is given in a certain technology. We can't play with it. It's not a design factor, as is the, the rho over here. We get um, uh, this uh, parameter, which is rho square, which is a, a constant for a certain type of a, of a metal layer or of, a, of a conduct, any type of conducting layer. So then all we have to do is, to, uh, is um, multiply this uh, rho square times the L over W. And L over W is actually the number of squares that we have in the design. So if we were to divide this resistor into or conductor into a bunch of square squares where this is a square, then um, that is exactly L over W. It's L divided by W is the number of squares. So we can just count the number of squares we have in a certain conductor. Right? We take this, we say, aha, there are four squares. So it's four times R square. And it could be that we take a much bigger conductor, right? But if in a uh, much wider thing, this will have the same exact resistance. Okay. Um, so when we talk about that, we have to look at the different uh, conductivities of materials. And um, we can look at the bulk resistivity, the rho over here. Um, for what we uh, used to use, which was aluminum, it was 2.8. And uh, of course, we want to get as a lower rho, as low as bulk resistivity as possible. So we tried to look for better, um, better conductors. Gold is a better conductor. It's actually used often for wire bonds and um, so forth because it's a good conductor. But it's very flexible and it's not that easy to use in, in a type of CMOS process. It doesn't gain us all that much. A much better conductor is copper. It gets a bulk resistivity of 1.7. And not only that, it's, um, very, uh, uh, it's very good against electromigration effects. We could go to silver, but silver is even more complicated to use and doesn't give us that big a benefit. Um, you should know that today they're going to new materials such as I think it, uh, such as RU, which um, can give us a good resistivity, but doesn't need barrier layers such as copper, which actually hurt the effective uh, resistivity. So um, the sheet resistance, this is the R square that we had before. Uh, the sheet resistance, or ohms to square, is the uh, units we give it in. Um, that should be given for each and every layer we have in a process. So this is just an example um, process that we would have different numbers. And uh, we usually take as kind of a uh, rule of thumb that R square is 100 milliohms per square. That's at least for a metal conductor. And we can see that in this process over here, metal 1 had 0 0.08, which is um, about... 100. It's 80 milliohms per square. Um, different metals will get lower um, resistance uh, per square, and that's because of the higher, uh, the, the the height is uh, larger, um, so we get uh, uh, less resistance per square, even though it'll probably be the same metal material. And we'll discuss that in a few minutes. Um, we can also route with other layers, and we often do, or at least there are different layers that are used for uh, for conductance, um, at least in short uh, amounts. So polysilicon that is silicided, it has uh, 3 to 10 uh, rows per square, and diffusion that's silicided also has 3 to 10 rows per square. There is a spread. Um, it's not a very accurate type of resistance uh, when we do that. If we want a big resistor, we can use an N-well or a P-well. They have 1,000 to 1,500. But again, we get a big spread of the resistance, uh, resistivity of such layers. Um, 
If we want to make a nice resistor, often polysilicon is used because it has much smaller design uh, requirements than, uh, than the N-well and P-well, and it also has a lower spread of the resistivity. But there we would put a, uh, a silicide block type of a, a layer on top, so we wouldn't actually grow the silicide on top of this polysilicon to get a nice resistor. Um, nice resistors won't be used in, in digital type circuits usually, but in uh, analog circuits they're used, and to get high um, resistance, what we'll actually do is we'll usually snake around this type of a, of a uh, poly layer, and then if you count the number of squares, it comes out uh, um, quite a lot when we do that. So that's a, a real way to build resistors and to make them um, uh, usually it, we use all kinds of matching layout techniques to to get a, a good match for a, a voltage divider or something um, rather than trying to be accurate in the exact uh, resistance that a poly type of a wire comes out. And um, here we see a picture on the side of the silicide so a silicide block won't actually grow this top layer over here which re re reduces the resistance. What about contacts? Well, contacts and vias, they add extra resistance. Okay, um, why are uh, why do they add extra resistance? You can see see it as a similar to changing between roads on the way to a destination. If you go straight, it's going to be faster than uh, keep on going left and right and changing ways when you're uh, trying to connect two dots. The contact resistance is generally between two and twenty ohms. The reason, uh, of course, being that these contacts they tend to be um, uh, kind of have this aspect ratio that's uh, high and thin um, and then they get this uh, big resistance when we, we go through them. Um, they also have these liners and uh, adhesive types of layers that connect them uh, well to the other areas. Um, another thing is that current crowds around uh, the context and what we call the skin effect and it doesn't uh, um, go through that well. Um, so that's one of the reasons. In a dual damascene process the contacts are made out of um, uh, copper in the past they used to be made out of uh, things like uh, tungsten okay uh, so the current crowds around and so we don't want to make the contact uh, necessarily bigger because it won't give us as big a benefit in, a, in our resistance um, and it also has all kinds of effects in the process um, being made so uh, what we actually usually do is give uh, some sort of a practical size a s certain size of the contact and we'll use many um, multiple contacts that are actually in parallel to each other to res reduce the resistivity so for example uh, if we're making a uh, rail that it's supposed to drive current, uh, to drive uh, current to to VDD and ground and so forth. When we go between two different layers, we'll put an array of contacts on top to make the resistance between the two layers as low as possible. There is a question of how this adds uh, overlap capacitance. For for example, if we take a uh, uh, a type of a gate, uh, let's say. It looks uh, maybe uh, something like this is the gate, and then we put a bunch of contacts next to it, and we want to connect well to the diffusions. Sorry, my uh, drawings in 3D aren't that great, but if this is the diffusion down here, and this is the gate, right, or something like that, um, then we actually do get these uh, uh, coupling capacitance, which adds to the overlap capacitance of uh, the gate to the uh, source or something like that. So we have to decide if uh, what's better for us to have the higher overlap capacitance or the lower resistance to the, to the diffusion. Well, how do we deal with resistance? So there are several ways that we do it. We can selectively scale the technology. If we don't scale the H, of course, if we keep our um, uh, our conductors uh, higher, then uh, the the R square becomes lower. Remember that um, uh, R square R R square equals rho divided by H. If uh, we keep the H high, then R square goes down, and that's a good thing, and that's been done often. A second option is to use better interconnect materials, and as I showed you before, we can use uh, copper layers, we can do silicides, um, and that's uh, something else we can do. Okay, we can use more interconnect layers. So if we use more interconnect layers, we um, actually can make it from uh, place to place with uh, with uh, less um, de uh, you know uh, detours. So if I want to go from this point to this point on the chip, and there's something else in the middle here, I would have to detour around it. Whereas with if I'm uh, going up to a higher metal layer, I could just go up and down or something like that. Um, I can get a an effective length that may be a lot lower the more metal layers I have. So it's kind of like with a highway when I would divide it into multiple levels. 
Okay, uh, minimize contact resistance. So if I use single layer routing and I do not go up and down many contacts, I'm going to have less of this uh, serial resistance. It's going to be added by the contacts. And uh, when I do have to change layers, if I can use more contacts, the better. So that's a short part about resistance. And now let's go into the modeling of interconnect. So in a schematic, um, the wire has no parasitics. The wire is a single equipotential region. There's no effect on circuit behavior. And this is very effective in the first stages of design and for very short wires. And usually, we will draw the wires and assume that they're ideal. It makes things much easier. But actually, that's not the case. And if we do add some sort of uh, um, parasitic to the wire, we'll usually use a lumped model. We'll assume that the resistance is negligible. And then all of the parts of the wire have um, their capacitance that's uh, in, uh, in parallel. Okay, um, the driver, it will have some sort of a higher uh, kilo ohm type uh, re on resistance. The wire will have a lower resistance, say an ohm, and then we can either um, uh, neglect it altogether or just add it in, uh, in a lumped way. We put it uh, in, in, ser in series with the on resistance of the driver, and it really becomes negligible. And then we get this nice type of an RC model that we've used before, and things work out really great. We know that uh, we can figure out the TPD equals 0.69 RC in that case, and uh, life is good. It's really simple. We can, we can assume what happens in our model. But actually, our um, wire is a distributed entity. Um, each piece of this wire is actually made up of at least some resistance and some capacitance. That's why we're neglecting the uh, inductance. So if we would take this uh, long wire over here that goes, uh, that's connected between the driver and the receiver, and we would divide it into pieces of uh, the length, uh, the length dx. And um, this dx has some sort of uh, r and some sort of c. So if uh, r is the uh, resistance per length unit and the c is the capacitance per length unit, the length is dx. So we get a resistor of r dx and a capacitor of c dx. So we can uh, draw the, our schematic of this. We have this uh, r and this c dx, and we have many, many, many of them. So we'll take uh, some sort of a, 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 a junction over here, and we'll say that the voltage at this point is vi, as you can see here. And then this will be vi minus 1, and this will be vi plus 1. Okay, And what we're going to do, actually, is going to look at this uh, type of a capacitor, and we're going to say that the um, current through it is just a, a sum of the currents through here, uh, through the left and the right resistor. Okay, so we know that IC, the current going into here, is VI minus 1 minus VI divided by RDX. Okay, so if this is uh, the voltage, it's VI minus 1 minus VI divided by RDX. That will give us the uh, current over here. Minus the current over here is going to be VI minus VI plus 1 divided by RDX. And that's going to give us the current over here, and that's IC. And we also know that IC is going to be equal to CDX, which is the size of the capacitor, times the uh, voltage change on on, uh, on this capacitor. So it's dVi to dt. Well, what we get is uh, basically um, uh, RC uh, d to the VI over dt equals d squared VI over dx squared. And that's a diffusion uh, or, a, or a, wave, uh, a wave equation. And... Um, we know that this is how, from differential equations, how uh, waves um, propagate through a circuit. And that makes sense. So basically, our current is propagating through this um, conductor as a wave. Um, one thing we can see here, the, the time coefficient, the tau of this thing is going to be uh, small r, small c, times big L squared, where L is the distance, uh, the, the whole length of the wire, um, divided by 2. And the TPD is going to be uh, come out uh, 0.38 RC, where R is RL and C is little CL. So the total R and the total C of the, the of this uh, conductor, if we would have lumped it together. Remember that when we used the lump model, what we got was 0.69 RC. So actually, the the time that it takes for a the, this wave to reach um, the receiver over here, or to pass VDD over two at the receiver over here, is almost ha it's about half of what it was took us in our lump model, and that 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 brings us to a couple of very important um, conclusions. So first of all. Uh, the first conclusion is that we have uh, L squared over here. And L squared is uh, quadratic. That means that if we uh, uh, make our wire longer, the delay is going to go up uh, uh, in a quadratic dependence. And that's really bad. So we want to have short wires. 
Okay. The second um, kind of conclusion that we have is that the lump model, as we said before, which was 0.69 RC, is very pessimistic because the actual delay to the end through this distributed line is going to be 0.38 RC. Let's look at a step response of such a wire. So if we take um, this driver that gets a, a step response at the input, and it's going to have this rising response at the output, and we take different points upon the wire, a tenth of the length, a quarter of the length, half of the length, and the full length, what we're going to see here is that this blue line is going to be um, how the step response uh, reached this point over here, it's going to be kind of nice and kind of what we um, thought we would see uh, usual. But you see that the other things are going to be much slower um, rising than and, and that's kind of a wave propagation um, through the wire. So how do we uh, model this distributed capacitor or this distributed wire? Well, if we take a, um, a driver with a load, okay, and we have some sort of a wire, what we're going to say here is that uh, this wire now is distributed, but the um, driver itself, it has some sort of, in, in, it has the on resistance of the inverter, and it has the uh, in, in internal capacitance of the inverter. And there, that's not distributed. That's a, an internal part of the inverter. That's a, a point type of a thing. And the load here we have, remember, we have this um, infinite inverter because what we see is a CMOS gate. So we just have a load over here. And again, it's not distributed. It's just a, a load that's given. Okay, so we're going to get a type of a, uh, a, of a uh, of a scheme that looks like this, and when we take that, we can um, model it. We can we can figure out what it is in in the in in this way. So um, we basically have the uh, the inverter the resistance over here sees all of the capacitance that's after it, which is the C inverter plus the C wire plus the C load, and they're just uh, like a lumped capacitor. So we can just go 0.69 times the inverter plus the wire, and then it'll be plus the load over here. Okay, what about the R wire? So that's not the same thing. So the C load, actually, it sees the R wire and the R inverter as if they were lumped. But the R wire itself, it sees the C wire as if it's a distributed capacitance. And we saw before that the, um, the TPD of, uh, of, of a uh, distributed was, uh, uh, was 0.38 RC. So um, this R sees this C distributed, so we have an 0.38 R wire, C wire in this, in this type of uh, thing. So one way uh, really to model this is we look at the different parts of our circuit and we see which ones should be addressed as a distributed 0.69 type of a factor versus what, which one should be an 0.38 type of a factor. For some uh, rules of thumb, uh, as we said, as we mentioned uh, dur during earlier parts of this um, lecture, the C wire is about 0.2 femtofarad per micron, and the R square is about 0.1 ohm per uh, square. Um, of course, these are not accurate, and you should check with your PDK what it exactly is, or to be more accurate, use your extraction program to get a, a real good number of those, uh, what, it, what it actually is. Anyway. Um, the differential equation or the diffusion equation that we had before, it's pretty complex, especially if we start to have all kinds of fan outs and all kinds of uh, differentiations from what we had before. Um, luckily, Elmore came a long, long time ago and pr proposed a reasonably accurate method to achieve an approximation of the dominant pole. So um, just to remind you or go over what Elmore is, um, if we have a one-dimensional type of a circuit such as we had before, what we do in the algorithm is we take the first capacitor and we look at what types of uh, resistance we our um, our current has to see in order to fill up this capacitor and so we see c1 times r1 then we take this capacitor and we say c2 what does it have to go through it has to go through r1 plus r2 in order to uh, fill up this capacitor and the third one c3 it needs to uh, take r1 plus r2 plus r3 to fill up the capacitor and so altogether if we want to find the, uh, the the tau uh, for through Elmore, it's R1 C1 plus R1 plus R2 C2 plus R1 plus R2 plus R3 times C3. Um, I also want to explain to you why this uh, kind of uh, intuitively makes sense, or why the wave propagation and so forth makes sense before. Um, so.
uh, again, if we took the lumped uh, type of a model where we had our inverter uh, with our resistance over here and our capacitor at the end, then we assume that every single electron that's going through here um, in order to fill up this capacitor has to see all this resistance. But that's not, in fact, the case when we, we distribute it in, in such a way. The um, first capacitance, it doesn't need to go through the entire lumped. It doesn't need to go through R1, R2, and R3 to fill up here. So it will fill up much faster. And then we can... Uh, uh, start only uh, uh, focusing on the second capacitor and again th this only has to go through R1 and R2 to, uh, two to see it and the third one only has to focus on um, uh, 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 it doesn't uh, again that uh, the, the third one is lumped uh, when it looks over this way at all of these uh, resistors but um, we don't have to deal with C1 and C2 when we're just uh, filling up our C3 so that's why it tells you that C3 fills up lower because it has to go through up through more serial resistance and why the lump type of a model which assumes that all this R is in series with uh, all of this C is much more uh, uh, is much more pessimistic than an actual distributed kind of model so anyway we see that um, Elmore gives a good estimation of the diffusion uh, the diffusion equation or uh, if we did a real thing by looking at a generalized ladder chain so let's divide the entire water in, uh, wire into n equal segments of length dx equals big L divided by n. So we have n uh, segments and uh, L is the length of our wire. So if we have uh, we, each piece of the wire is L divided by n and uh, each one of them has a capacitance of C which is again the uh, capacitance per, per unit of length times this uh, length dx and the resistance is R times dx and of course we'll take n to be as large as possible so that dx becomes infinitesimal. Okay, so if we do that, what we have again is we have the, the same picture we had before. So we have a little type of a wire with a, uh, uh, um, a piece of capacitor, another resistor, another capacitor, and so forth and so on, where each of these guys is going to be uh, RDX and each of these guys is going to be CDX. The total length will be L and uh, there will be a total of N of these. So each is, So DX equals L divided by N. And again, what we have with Elmore is we take each capacitor. This capacitor is times RDX. The second capacitor is times RDX plus RDX. So that's two RDX. So here you can see that we have CL times N or CDX. That's each one of these is CDX multiplied by RDX and then two RDX and then three RDX, four RDX, etc. until we get N RDX. Okay, so that's a, uh, a general um, uh, formula to, to, to discuss this. We can take L over N out of the uh, parenthesis here. So we get L over N squared times RC plus 2RC plus NRC. We can also take RC out and we get RC uh, L squared times N times N uh, plus 1 divided by 2N squared. Okay, and um, when we take N to infinity, that becomes RC L squared divided by 2. Um, or RC, a big RC divided by two, and we see that's a very good approximation of what we got before from the, the diffusion uh, equation without having to deal with any uh, differential equations. So that's why Elmore actually works. So how do we um, use uh, Elmore delay? For a complex network, uh, we'll use the following method. We'll find all the resistors uh, on the path from in to out. Then for every capacitor, we'll find all the resistors on the path from the input to the capacitor and multiply the capacitance by the resistors that are also on the path to out. The dominant pole is approximately the sum of all of these time constants. And here is a type of a um, uh, description of that, um, uh, of that type of algorithm. Well, let's see uh, how it actually works because uh, it's kind of hard to understand that just by reading the algorithm. So we take um, this simple example and again we go to each capacitor. So we'll start with C1. We'll look at C1. We'll see, um, wait, excuse me. The first thing we'll do is we'll look at the into out path. So that's the into out path. Okay, that's where the, um, the charge has to go in order to fill the, this uh, final V out type of a node. Okay, so that's our into out path. Now we'll take our first capacitor, this one C1, and we'll say that every, every um, uh, charge that goes into here, it has to go through R1. So we'll have R1 times C1. Then we'll go over to C2. C2, every, uh, every charge that goes into here has to go through R1 and R2 in order to fill C2. So we have R1 plus R2 times C2. And then we have to go to C3. So C3, I 
I think of it as kind of a hose that's filling up your swimming pool. And this is your swimming pool, but the neighbor's tapped into it and is stealing some of the water along the way. So any water that goes into here, it also goes through um, part of the path that's over here. We don't care about the delay that's added until C3 fills up, but we do care about how much it steals along the way. So we take C3 and we look at how much uh, of the the, the um, path to C3 is actually on the path that goes from in to out, and we see it's only R1, so we have here R1 times C3. And then we get the dominant pole, uh, according to Elmore, again, will be a sum of all those. So R1 C1 plus R1 plus R2 C2 plus R1 times C3. A more complex example can be seen here. So we're going to have um, our input to our output is over here. And this will be uh, the, the um, uh, path that we're going to go on. And we have to start from C1. So C1 is going to be only multiplied by R1. OK, we go to C2. C2, again, this part is not on the path. Only this is. So C2 is going to be times R1. OK, we go to C3. C3. Uh, both of these are on the path, so three C3 times R1 plus R3, okay? C4, C4 is going to also be R1 and R3, C4 times R1 plus R3, and finally CI over here is going to be R1, R3, and RI. So CI times R1 plus R3 plus RI, and we're going to sum all of those together, and that's going to be our tau of Elmore. So what does that tell us? It tells us that um, we should take a distributed wire and we should not use it as just a, a lumped type of a model. In fact, we can take one of these models, the pi model or the t model, which are shown here. And even by just taking this simple um, model, uh, uh, we're going to get a good estimation. So let's say we take this model over here, the, the pi 2 model. We have half of the capacitance over here, c over 2. We have half of the resistance over we have the resistance over here and the other half of the capacitance over here, C over two. And when we look over from this side, what we're gonna do is we're gonna take C over two times zero plus C over two times R. So we get a total of R uh, C over two, which is similar to our um, Elmore delay, which is not um, which is not the pessimistic type of view. We can take the T model over here and we get a similar thing. So with the uh, simple T model, we get R over two over here, R over two over here, um, and the capacitance is the full capacitance over here. And when we look at it, we take the C times R over two, and the whole tau comes out R C over two, which again is not the um, uh, the 0.69 R C on this distributed part. It uh, takes into account um, only the uh, half of that if we look at it through Elmore or if we actually use a simulator to figure out the diffusion equation. Okay, and we can um, get a bit more accuracy if we take a Pi 2 or a Pi 3 model and we use a simulator. But you should always make your wires um, using this type of a, one of these Pi or T models. So if um, we have the Elmore delay and we want to use a Pi model to do this uh, by hand kind of on a, on a piece of paper, let's see how it works. So we have our same picture here before of our driver, our receiver, and our wire in the middle. And now we're going to put the, the pi model over here. So C wire over 2, R wire, and C wire over 2. And we can easily see that um, we take these two capacitors, which are actually um, parallel, so they are lumped together. C inverter plus C wire over 2 times R inverter. So C inverter plus C wire over 2 times R inverter. Then um, we take the, the other two, these are also can be lumped together, so we get C wire over 2 plus C load, and they would be multiplied by R inverter plus R wire, plus R wire, okay, and we uh, that will be our tau. So again, C inverter plus C wire over 2 over to plus R inverter plus C load plus C wire over 2 times R inverter plus R wire. So um, that's the same type of a model that we showed before when we just uh, multiplied this distributed guy by 0.38, but uh, now it's using the pi model instead to do it, which makes it a bit more, uh, uh, it's a bit easier to use. So remember we said before that uh, the wire delay is uh, quadratically proportional 
to uh, to the length of the wire we had RCL uh, squared so that means we don't want to have long wires in our design but what if we have a chip here and it has a uh, model over module over here with an inverter and a module over here with uh, with a with a receiver and we have this long wire that traverses a long length and again we have this L squared proportion which is really bad so what we're going to do is put in re uh, repeaters putting in repeaters is as simple as just breaking this wire um, with uh, types of uh, buffers um, and again we can use buffers which would a buffer is just two inverters next to each other but then we kind of lose out on uh, the the load driving of the buffers so it's better to use um, inverters divided into a bunch of inverters so we would have a line that looked like this um, we would take a uh, uh, we could either put two inverters in like one here and one here we could put four inverters in I don't know could put another one here and another one here and so forth these are called repeaters um, tools will do it automatically you can also refer to the rabbi textbook um, and see uh, some uh, some calculations of how to do this in an optimal type of a way similar to the driving a load uh, type of uh, calculations that we've done in previous courses another thing uh, that's similar like that is a buffer tree intuition i guess the the uh, most common um, trees of a uh, high fan out are the clock um, and the repeat and the reset tree um, but in, in in general if we have high fan out what we're going to usually want to do is uh, instead of just uh, driving one with a big uh, type of a driver we're going to want to put in a tree um, clock tree synthesis is a much more complex type of a uh, thing that we'll we'll talk about in, a, in a, that i talk about in the digital vlsi design course but um, when we're just uh, looking at it in a general type of a way, or this is also done for things like reset trees or other high fan out no, uh, nodes, what we're going to do is this, uh, say, so we have um, one driver and uh, a multiple, uh, multiple receivers. What we're going to actually do is divide this into a tree. Um, it does not have to be binary. It probably usually won't be binary. Uh, but each one of these drives a bunch of these, and each one of these drives a bunch of these. And then um, each one of these will be connected to a certain number of, uh, of outputs and so forth. These might be connected to a few and so forth. So this type of a tree, it will make the wires shorter. It will make the load of each one smaller. So we divide the load um, equivalently along the way plus having a short wire. So that's another thing that is done by the tools. Uh, um, during a place and route type of thing, you want to insert a buffer tree or else this high fan out is going to cause really high load and therefore high transition, uh, problems with signal integrity, etc. on our type of wire. So that was uh, interconnect modeling and uh, in the next part of the lecture we'll shortly discuss wire scaling.